Good morning. And it's lovely to see you all today. And it's extra lovely because it's not quite so hot. <laughs> for those of us that don't like the heat. And for those of us that do, my condolences. <laughs> Let's just close our eyes and acknowledge that God is with us. And we thank him for the gift of this new day, full of opportunities and possibilities. And we ask him to bless us as we gather together in his name to worship him. Amen. Now I'm going to begin this morning by reading from the book of Isaiah and we're continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I'm enjoying very much um, the, the uh, series of animations that help explain it and uh, we're going to be looking at one of those a bit later and then Michael's going to bring God's word to us. But let's begin with some words from Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2, 1 to 5. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. So come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. We have the privilege, don't we, of knowing him of knowing his ways and of reflecting his glory. And we're going to sing our opening song this morning to God. Be the glory, great things he has done. Hallelujah. And uh, we're going to stand, it's 279 if you're using the books. We should hopefully have the words coming up. We're going to stand if we're able to and raise our voices in praise to God this morning. Let's stand and worship
be seated. Come to the Father through Jesus, the Son. And I love that line, it opened the floodgates and welcomed us in. So I want you to close your eyes this morning as we begin worship. And Lord, we say thank you because we didn't know you. We didn't know your name. We didn't see your face. We didn't know what you thought or understand your ways. So you sent us somebody who was like us to walk alongside us and show us the way. Somebody who knew what it was like to be hungry and poor and thirsty and tired. To be part of a big family and also a small village. Who knew what it was like to deal with the crowds of the city and the problems of farming. You walked on this earth and you showed us your face and you taught us your heart and I thank you because now we can come to the Father we can call him Father we can know his him as our friend we can lift our heads up no longer do we have to be ashamed because you have called us your own and gathered us together as one family, wherever we come from in the world, whatever circumstances we were born into, you have touched us with your grace and with your glory and called us your children, the children of the King of Kings. And I pray that something of the glory of Jesus will go with us as we leave this place. That every person we speak to, every person we interact to, every person we meet, whether it's the hairdresser or the person in the supermarket or the neighbour or the guy at the bus stop, will be touched with something of the glory of God. Because we came to the Father today through Jesus the Son. Amen. Amen. Does anyone remember uh, Michael Jackson? Yeah. Sorry. I love, I love Billy Jean. <laughs> Billy Jean. And in Billy Jean, everywhere that he steps and everything that he touches turns to gold. A bit like Midas, you know? And I think that we are the carriers of the light of God. Every step that we take becomes holy ground, doesn't it? Everywhere we go becomes holy ground. Every conversation has the possibility of gold and glory in it. So, you know, next time you listen to Billie Jean, or if you're a bit more educated than that and you think about Midas, think about going out with the glory of God everywhere we go. We're taking him with us. And the world will be changed. You're looking at me. Doreen's agreeing with me. Yeah, she's a Jackson fan. Everybody else is not sure. That's okay. All right, we'll talk about it later. Now, we're going to enjoy um, the Bible Project video on the Sermon on the Mount. This is the introduction to the sermon series. And I really was blessed by this video because you get to see Jesus talking to ordinary people and lifting them up. And I hope this morning that you'll be blessed as well as we enjoy this together. If you've ever heard of Jesus of Nazareth, you probably know he was a famous teacher. And his most well-known words have shaped the lives of billions of people throughout history. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do to others what you would have them do to you. Now, those sayings come from a collection of Jesus' teaching that's sometimes called the Sermon on the Mount. It's only three chapters long, but its ideas and images have endured throughout time. You are the salt of the earth. You can't serve both God and money. 
Take the plank out of your eye before you take the speck out of another's. In the sermon are some really challenging teachings. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, turn and offer him the other cheek. Love your enemy and bless those who persecute you. And there are also some really puzzling teachings. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. But the Sermon on the Mount is not a random collection of Jesus' teachings. They've been organized in a beautiful way so that it's easier to remember and meditate on. There are three main parts of the sermon, the middle of which has three parts, and then each of those middle parts themselves have three parts. Wow, the sermon has been carefully designed. Yes, and right at the center of the center is the famous prayer that Jesus taught his followers. Our Father in heaven, may your name be treated as holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what does that mean for God's kingdom to come on earth? Well, we have to remember that Jesus was Jewish, and he grew up meditating on the Hebrew Bible, the sacred scriptures of Israel, and they told the story of God and all humanity. How God created a well-ordered world and appointed humans to rule it on his behalf. And when humans rule with God's wisdom and love, and when justice and peace prevail and there's enough for everyone, that is God's kingdom and God's will being done here on earth as it is in heaven. And that's no easy task. Humans foolishly rebel and start building their own kingdoms by their own wisdom. And so God chose one family, the Israelites, and he offered them his wisdom. It was called the Torah, which in Hebrew means the teaching. And beginning with Moses on Mount Sinai, God entered into a sacred covenant with them. Why only select one family? Well, the goal was for the Israelites to be transformed by God's wisdom so that they could represent God's kingdom before all the nations. But in Jesus' day, God's kingdom was nowhere to be seen. In fact, Israel was under the thumb of Roman oppressors. So what happened? Why isn't God's kingdom coming? Well, many religious leaders, like the scribes and the Pharisees, they thought it wasn't coming because Israel wasn't being faithful enough to the Torah. Other leaders, called the Sadducees, thought it would be best if Israel found a way to cooperate with Rome, and so they became the power brokers of Jesus' day. Some ran for the hills to become freedom fighters against Rome. They're known as the Zealots. And still others withdrew to the desert, waiting for God to use them to start a new Israel. But walk around the hill country of Israel, like Jesus did, and you'll mostly find normal people figuring out their lives as best they can. Most were barely hanging on, lots of poor and sick people. Many had lost their land to the Roman occupiers and were struggling to pay the heavy taxes. They were powerless and hopeless. And so Jesus went to these people, healing the sick and announcing that God's kingdom was arriving. People gathered from all over to hear his teachings. And one day, Jesus went up to a tall hill and said the arrival of God's kingdom was starting here and now with them. You mean with the powerless, the weak, the nobodies, God's kingdom begins here? Yes. This is why the very first line of the Sermon on the Mount is, blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, where can you go and see God's presence and blessing springing to life? Among the rich? Among the powerful? No, Jesus says. Look where people are poor, where they feel crushed and defeated. God's kingdom is beginning with the people standing right here. you could hear that was it okay yeah when I play it on Sundays it always sounds a lot faster than when I watch it at home but uh, it's a good introduction to the Sermon on the Mount and are we going to be enjoying looking at this together as a family but before we do that we're just going to have a time of prayer and um, because we do come we do live in a broken world don't we there's a lot of things that weigh heavy on our hearts and uh, it's right for us to bring those before God's throne in prayer this morning so we're going to sing beauty for brokenness 998 in our Salvation Army songbook in the blue songbook and uh, we should have the words coming up and we're going to sing this song through and then I'm going to open the service up if the Lord has put something particular 
on your heart this morning to pray about. I'm going to give us the opportunity to do that together now. Um, after we've finished singing this song, Beauty for Brokenness, because that's what Jesus comes to do, isn't it? To mend the brokenhearted and be close to those who are lonely and broken and sad. 998. Let's sing it through together.
Let's pray together. And if the Lord has laid something particularly on your heart this morning that you need to pray about, this is one of our opportunities to bring that collectively before his throne today. Let's pray. Lord, this morning I particularly want to pray for those who struggle in our community with issues of mental health. And sometimes they are not receiving the adequate support and treatment that they need. And life becomes extremely difficult for them. And I pray that you will open up the door somehow to meet their needs, but also even on an everyday basis, that we will be able to understand better how we as ordinary people can help to make them feel safe and listened to and supported. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you didn't turn your back on anybody but you offered the hand of healing and friendship and mercy and kindness and acceptance to all. And I pray that somehow we'll reflect that day by day in this place. Amen. Perhaps to close this time of prayer, we could pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power 
and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we have one or two special things that are going to happen as part of the service. And the first of them is that Kath and Carol are going to introduce a new song to us that is called, Have You Got the Sunshine of God in Your Life? And I'm hoping you can all answer that with a yes. And if you can't answer with that, with a yes, come and see me after the meeting. Okay. So they're going to come and sing it. We have got the words on a sheet. And I think you're going to sing it through to us and then you're hoping we might join in. Is that right? Or is it just a, a, a duet? Everybody. So come and stand at the front. Pam's been had to sing, haven't you? Okay, are you ready, ladies? Wonderful. standing up in front of us all and introducing a new song but I'm hoping this will catch on because there's lots of songs that people know that I don't know and actually it'd be good if we could share what blesses us with other people now we've got something else to do today that is important because Marie has walked 5,000 steps every day during the month of June to raise money for the Salvation Army, and not just the Salvation Army, the Salvation Army in Catford. (laughs) So she has raised £1,070, and uh, we're going to use that particularly for the community work that we do in Catford. Okay, because there are lots of people who come through the door in the week. We, I reckon there is about 200 people that go through those doors every week into this place for various reasons. And what Marie has done will mean that we can continue to support them. So we need to thank her very much. And I want her to come and collect her certificate of appreciation.
Lovely. Now, the other thing that we're going to do is that Sharon has introduced us to an old song but a new song. It's in our songbook. Okay, there is a holy hill of God. It's very popular in Zimbabwe, isn't it? So, so on the page, we have got, I could only find some of the words in Shona. It's Shona, isn't it? So I could only find some of them in Shona. And then next door to it are the words in English. And uh, Sharon, did you want to say anything about this song this morning? Come to the front so we can hear you. Come, come and sit. Do it in the mic. People can hear you online. Okay. Right. I'm not going to sing it though. <laughs> anyway, um, this song is a very special song to me. Um, it's a bittersweet kind of song. When I feel like um, singing praises, it's my go-to song. But most importantly, when I'm feeling down and I want to pray, but the words don't come out, so I use this song as a channel of prayer to God for me. So that's why it's a special song for me. That's really important. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think that's important for us to hear because sometimes we don't have our own words, do we? And sometimes music and song, God, we can use to enable us to pray, to know that we're entering God's presence. I do that with, um, with um, all sorts of things, songs that are come to my mind. I think the Holy Spirit gives them to me and says, use this one for you today. So we're going to enjoy a video of, uh, this, is a, of this song being sung in Shona. By, uh, is he famous, this man? Well, I knew him from being this song, but, you know. So he's recorded this song, which means it's out there on the internet, Salvation Army song. And as we enjoy it, you can sing along if you want to. We're going to give to the Lord in the offering as well as we enjoy this song together. I'm going to try and pronounce it, Riri Pugombu Ramwawi. Riri Pogomora Mari Mea Oriwana Dino da Puri Shikira Disi Eshenika Riri Pogomora Mari Mea Oriwana Dino da Puri Shikira Disi Eshenika
Simire munzimbo Tene umo Niko shanda The chorus of that, which you, you perhaps see there, Lord, cleanse my hands and cleanse my heart. All selfish aims I flee. My faith reward thy love in part, and let me dwell with thee. It's a song that, that cause, calls us, doesn't it, in closer, greater relationship with God, just giving up everything, putting aside everything else just to know his love and to know him. So, th Sharon, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Now, oh, I'll let you do that. Yes, it does. Now, we should have the Bible reading. Is the Bible reading not there? Matthew 5. So, uh, we're continuing on with the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through to 16. So, quite a, a small little portion, but quite a significant part. It's on page 969 in the core Bibles. You, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. I know we just prayed for the offering, but let's pray again as we get ready to receive God's word. Father God, we just come before you, and as we look at this teaching which you gave in your, your Sermon on the Mount, we pray that you, yeah, you will open our hearts and minds, you will give us understanding. And just, I pray for myself, Lord, that you will just help me to bring your word faithfully and as you want it presented. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Good morning. How are you feeling today? Marie said, I saw her. I congratulated. I said, how are you feeling? A month after 5,000 steps, she said, my feet hurt a little bit. (laughs) I don't blame you. Maybe your feet hurt a little bit. But are you ready to go up the mountain again? Are we ready to go up the mountain and hear the words of Jesus? For those of you who, who might not have been here last week, we started a sermon on the, uh, we started a series on the Sermon on the Mount. And it starts with Jesus inviting people to go up the mountain with him. And one of the purposes of doing that was to see who was really wanting to hear what he had to say. Who was willing to make the effort to climb up the mountain? So we started this series, and we said as part of that, the the sermon, and it was in the video, that is divided into three main sections. The three, it didn't give the names in there. The first section, which which we're going to finish off today, is about the surprising identity of those who belong to the kingdom of God. It deals with those who are a part of it, and we started that by looking at the Beatitudes, where Jesus is saying, blessed is the poor, blessed, um, sorry, I've forgot them already, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and so on. He was talking about the character of the people that will belong to the kingdom of heaven that, that he's looking to bring in. This second bit, looking at identity, is about the impact that those people will have on the world. What their surprising identity will do to those around them. The second part, the bigger part, is all about a higher righteousness. Jesus does all these little um, case studies or examples where he says, you've heard it said this, but I say this. And he always takes it to a higher level and then it finishes with this choice, what will you do in response to what's being said? So this morning we're going to think about being the, the, being the salt of the earth and being the light and a city on a hill. Now let me ask, when you think of salt, what kind of things come into your mind about salt? Taste, flavor, white, the color. Salt brings you happiness. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, you're looking at it as the metaphor. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Food, yeah, we think of food. We think, we can think of, we can think of, purification can't we or preservation because it's used in preserving food we put salt in when we cook or we bake to make food last longer we salt can be used to clean all sorts of different things now the problem is salt is so varied in its understanding it's difficult to know exactly what Jesus is trying to say when he says you are the salt of the world So to understand what Jesus means when he says, you are the salt of the world, we actually have to first look at what it means to be the light of the world. And then once we understand what it means to be the light of the world, we can understand what it means to be the salt of the world. So we're going to do things in reverse order today. We're going to think about being the light and the city on the hill. I want to read to you again um, Isaiah 2, okay? And maybe you want to close your eyes because it's painting a picture, Isaiah 2. So allow your brain to paint the picture as you hear the words if, if you're that way inclined. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, says concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days... The mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the heights of the mountains. It will be exalted among the hills and all nations will stream into it. Many people will come and say, 
Let us go up on to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. You will see us. Sorry, he will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will dis settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. There's something that happens to you when you become a dad. Okay? Because before I was a dad, I was funny. But now that I'm a dad, everything, every joke apparently I say is a dad joke. Which, which a dad joke is often seem to be lame and silly and, and not very funny, isn't it? And um, I've got some examples of some dad jokes today. I think these are pretty funny dad jokes, to be honest. But you can let me know what you think. Maybe because I became a dad, I lost my humor. I don't know. So the first one's this. Okay, these are all puns because a lot of dad jokes are puns, aren't they? The fattest night at King Arthur's round table was circumference. He acquired his size from too much pie. Hopefully some of you get that. That was a math joke at the end there. Hydrin will get that one, won't you? you you're good at maths. Okay, what do you call a priest who became a lawyer? A father-in-law. Time flies like an arrow. Fruit flies like a banana. <laughs> Were they funny? So-so. Mm, some, some, some of them, some of them not. Any, anyways, the great thing about puns is, is we get to play with English, don't we? We, we take the kind of uncertainty sometimes, the, the, the double meaning of words, and we play off them to, to make a humorous statement, don't we? Now, I'm not suggesting for a second that Isaiah in chapter 2 here is telling a joke. He's not telling a joke. But he's playing with language that we don't immediately see what's going on. Because actually, it's not immediately apparent to us, but that little bit I just read there and the bit that then goes on, that is a poem. That, that's why when it's written, it's, it's formatted slightly different than, than some of the other verses, because it's a poem. It's indicating it, there's a change going on. Now, we don't get the poem because we're not speaking Hebrew. Okay, so let me let you in on a little something. The word in Hebrew for light is or. Okay? The word for law or instruction is Torah. You see? Or, Torah. Okay? And the word to the act of teaching or instructing is Yora. So every time we see a word that is talking about teaching or talking about the law or instruction or light, those words all rhyme. Now, the thing that's helpful to us about this isn't just that that is, is a little poem, but it shows us about the relationship between the words, doesn't it? Because or and Torah and Yora. They all have a root, don't they? The or, the, the light bit. They're all interrelated words, which can lead us to the safe conclusion that when, Jesus, when um, Isaiah is talking about light and then when Jesus is talking about light, he's talking about the law. He's talking about instruction. And we get in this Isaiah bit here, an, a picture of kind of what Jesus is talking about when he's saying, be you are the light of the world. 
He's giving an image of what the world will be like when God's law is the thing that drives stuff. It gives us this wonderful picture. What does it say to us? Come, let us go. Uh, come, go up the mountain to the Lord, to the temple of God of Jacob. Now, where's the temple? Where is the temple, or where was the temple at the time? It was in Jerusalem, wasn't it? The city on the hill. Ha ha ha! The city on the hill. Jerusalem. And what happens there? The nations will stream into it. The temple will be a place of yora, be a place of instruction and teaching. So when Jesus says, talks about a city on a hill and you are the light of the world, he's talking broadly about us, the church which has come about, that we are to be a place of instruction where people come in and are taught about God and who he is and what he wants for us. And then what happens? Isaiah says, they go out. They then go out into the world to bring God's instruction to the rest of the world. We're drawn in, we're taught, and we go out. Okay? And then the, the picture develops even more and says when this happens, when, when the, the nations have streamed in, when they've learned the instruction of the Lord and they follow it, what's the impact? There's justice for people. God will settle people's arguments in, in an equitable way so that we're not having disputes anymore. So much to the point that the swords get turned into farming equipment. Can you imagine how much better our world would be, not just in the UK, but all over the world, if every nation took all the money they spent on defense and security and invested it in taking care of the poor, in health care, in our social justice systems, can you imagine how much better in making food? Literally, that's what it's saying. The resources will go into making food so nobody will be hungry. What a wonderful world that will be. We are meant to be the light. We are meant to be those people who are bringing... Actually, we are meant to be the people that are exampling what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to follow God's law. If we were to go, and we don't have time to read it, we could go to Isaiah 42. And in, in Isaiah 42, we see something happening, because this here to um, Isaiah 2 is talking about the nation. It's talking about the people. But actually, throughout Isaiah, from this point, Isaiah shows time and time again how the people failed to be that. How we failed to be the light. How Israel failed to be the light. And let's be honest, we often fail to be the light. But in Isaiah 42, it says, look, I'm going to send a servant who's going to take that role. Now, surprise me, who is the servant? Nice and loud. Jesus. Isaiah says all those years before Jesus comes, I'm going to send a servant. And he is, is not just going to give the light. He is going to be the light. He's going to embody what it means to live according to God's law. Now Jesus, who is our Savior, our source of salvation, um, are, are, are the way that we've connected to God again. What does he say of us? You are the light. He shares that role with us, not just to give instruction, but to actually embody, literally embody what it means to live out God's law in the world, to bring justice 
we're to be a community that instructs injustice, and we're to be people that go out like a, a lamp on a stand shining for the whole world to see so that God will get the glory of what it means to bring justice and be his people. That's big, isn't it? I just want to take a second. His followers are meant to embody living out the Father's teaching, leading others towards the kingdom of God. Let's just sit with that just for a second. Just let that sink into your head. So some of you might be wondering then, what does that have to do with salt? Now, let's go back to some of those things. We, we talked about salt as being flavor. We thought of salt as being a, a preservative. Now, one thing that we didn't mention, which is where we get the overlap, because if we look at light and we look at salt, in Isaiah 61, they talk about two things coming together. The covenant, the salt of the covenant, and the light. This is where salt and covenant, uh, salt and light overlap to do with covenant. What's a covenant? A covenant essentially is about relationship, isn't it? it it's about, um, in one sense, of not, of, I don't know if I should say a formal relationship, but a relationship with very clear guidelines of this is how this relationship works, isn't it? And God has been, been making covenants, making promises right from the beginning, didn't he? Adam and Eve, in a sense, that that was a covenant relationship. You can live in peace. You can dominate this place in this garden. Just don't eat from the tree in the middle. That was the covenant. It was simple, wasn't it? We couldn't do it, could we? We, we, we broke it, sadly. And then God goes on, doesn't he? He makes covenants with Abraham. He makes covenants with Noah. And ultimately, he, he makes this big covenant with Israel because of Noah, Noah's descendants, that they are to be the administrators of peace. A covenant is about relationship. So there's two other things about salt that help us here. The first is that we said that salt is a preservative, isn't it? In the sacrificial system, I don't know if you're aware or not, salt was used. The, the sacrifices were a, way, a means of administering the covenant. Salt was used within the covenants. Now, we also use salt, don't we, to preserve things. So the fact that it was used in, in the, um, the sacrifices, it... it in other words, in, rather than just making the meat taste nice, it, it was symbolic that the covenant that they were engaging with is a long-lasting covenant. God's covenant with us is long-lasting. And then there's that element we said, somebody said taste, didn't they? Or you said you thought about food when you thought about salt. When do we share food? We share food as families. We share food in relationships, don't we? This is all pointing us to, towards being the salt of the earth. We are, he's saying, you are the covenant, the relationship, the embodiment of what a relationship with me and you means. So now, being the covenant means two things. One, it means that we, and what Jesus was saying is, you are going to be the people that are going to see all the fulfillment of all the promises come true with. That's why the, we experience the Holy Spirit, isn't it? That's why we now experience, uh, can experience eternal life, because Jesus has come and conquered sin. And we experience many, many of his long-lasting promises. So we're blessed. 
We're a blessed people because of that. There's another side to that coin. What's the other side to the coin of experiencing his blessings? To be a blessing? Yes. I, Israel was meant to be a blessing, weren't they, to the other nations. And the way that they were a blessing was by showing them, other nations, other people, the way to God. And we do that by living according to his, his righteousness, don't we? We talked about righteousness before. Righteousness is very closely linked to justice, being people of justice. So we're called to be, you are the covenant, you are the word. Now, we're not replacing Jesus because often we use Jesus as an example of being the Word. John talks about the Word existed before, the Word became flesh. It's not that we are usurping Jesus, but be through our relationship with Jesus, He shares that role, that purpose of being His Word, of being a light. So what are we going to do with that? How are we going to respond to that call? Will we be the light? Embodying God's truth in the way that we live our lives and the words that we speak. Will we as a church be a city on a hill? Being a place not just of God's teaching for the purpose of learning, but for going out. And sharing it and showing it to others. Are we going to be the salt of the earth? Are we willing to embody the covenant? To be the covenant through the way we, we share relationship with each other, but more importantly, the way we share relationship with God. That's our choice. If you want to do that, I'm just going to pray. Just join in with me as we pray. Father God, we just come before you and we thank you. We thank you that you have invited us not just into your kingdom, but into a relationship with you that is so rich, so transformative, so life-changing, but world-changing at the same time. That you choose to use us to bring about your justice in the world, to bring about your truth in the world, to bring about peace in the world. And that, that you choose to be so closely connected to us. We pray just now, Lord, that you will give us the courage, the strength to make the decision to, to be the salt of the earth to embody not just the, the, the blessings, but also to be a blessing to others by showing other people towards you and by being the light and, and being showing the world what it means to live by your word and to be a community of believers where we are instructed in your truth. We ask this to be for us as individuals and us in this place. Amen. Amen. Oh, I've lost my plan. I've got no idea what's happening next. <laughs> Sorry, I've completely... Oh, there it is. Sorry, senior moment. Okay. So um, I think we will... Um, yeah, we will sing this song, 114. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. And um, I was looking at that image of a light bulb. You know, I could, I could hand a light bulb to somebody who'd never seen one before and say, this will change your life. 
But if it's not got the connection, it won't do anything, will it? And it's our connection to Jesus, our relationship with him, that makes the big difference about us being who we were meant to be and blessing the world. So we're going to sing this song, 114 in the songbook. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. And we're going to make this our prayer. Sometimes we don't have our own words, but as we sing this song through, this is going to be our prayer in response to what Jesus has done for us today. Make it your prayer today. And if you want to come to our place of prayer, again, it's always available as we sing together. 114. Jesus, I thank you so much for the touch of your hands on my life. And we just say, here we are to worship. We choose you, Jesus, because you chose us and lifted us up. And I pray that we will be able to be the light of the world. We'll be able to fulfill that call upon our lives, to make the world brighter, to make the world better, to make the world tastier, all that it should be to reflect your glory. Just help us to do that, Lord, because we can't do it by ourselves, but you can do it through us. Amen. Amen. 
Now, I'm going to try and remember all the announcements. First of all, Shirai and Patience are away because it was Shirai's uncle's funeral this weekend. This has been a big impact on his family, and we need to uphold them as a family in prayer. And they journeyed to Leeds for that funeral this weekend. So please keep praying for them. Please keep praying for Monica. Monica is back in Brymore, um, but she is no better. And we thank God for Monica and the joy that she brought us and still brings to us. But we pray God's continuing protection and blessing over her and that she will know that we love her and that she's not been forgotten. So please keep praying for Monica. Of the over 60s, one of them, Beryl, is out of hospital and another one, Sally, has gone in. It's like a revolving door. So please pray, continue to pray for Beryl and Sally. They're Doreen's neighbours. She brought them to over 60s and we're very glad to have them. Um, two events are coming up. Um, we are having a core barbecue on the 17th of August at our house. Okay, we can give you directions to our house. I think Ida and Iva are bringing some vegetarian food. And Shirai is doing something wonderful with... He's bringing a gazebo. So we'll have shade. So keep that date in your diary. The other date to keep on your diary is the 11th of August. Pam is retiring... And she's staying with us, God bless her. But we're going to celebrate on that day as part of the Sunday morning service everything that she has done and everything that she is because we're so thankful that she chose us. I don't know if you chose us, but you stuck with us. You choose us every week, don't you, Pam? She chooses us every week. And we're going to celebrate that faithful service that she's given to God on the 11th of August. So if you are able to come, if you're not on holiday, please be there. Because there will be cake. <laughs> as well as celebration. And the final announcement is that some weeks ago, Sharon turned 50... So she's horrified that I've said it. Sharon had a very special birthday a few weeks ago. And uh, she went on holiday to celebrate. But we need to celebrate as a family, don't we? So we're going to sing happy birthday to Sharon today. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. All I can say is welcome to the club. <laughs> and we're going to sing our final song, Colours of Day, Dawn Into the Mind. So light up the, the world. This, I love the chorus of this song. We're going to stand up and sing Colours of Day together as our final song of worship this morning. It's 250 if you're using the book. Colours of Day.
And now a very simple blessing for you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. And God bless you this day.